pleasure to be here. And uh, hopefully, of course, it's, it's quite challenging to, to speak at this time of an evening. Long, long day, <laughs> and I've been speaking quite a lot already, so some of you probably are already tired to hear me. But uh, let's, let's try to, to kind of keep the audience anyway awake so that you are not sleeping in, in the end of my presentation. So about the topic, it's really uh, construction industry is, is in, a, in a way quite unique that, that we really need usually some kind of um, drivers for the innovation. In other industries, it happens in, in a natural way, mm -hmm. but in our case, it's often the clients as I had in the title. So, First, I want to start that with, with one slide that is really showing that BIM is not something new. Of course, some of you know this, but, but for many people, it's really surprised that the first paper about BIM was uh, written by Chuck Eastman in 1975, so more than 40 years ago. So he was a real visionary because at that time, really, the computers were very, very primitive and, and you couldn't really imagine that they could have been having enough capacity to. to Process that. Just to, to kind of compare the situation that in 1975, the Cray supercomputer had about the same uh, capacity for calculations as the graphic processor in your phone has today. So it was quite quite different situation. And then for about 20 years, it was something that that it was mostly just a research issue. And then about 20 years ago, industry started to, to become interested in, in, in BIM, probably very much because uh, Autodesk was one of the founders of the Industry Alliance for Interoperability in, in 1994 in the United States, and in 1996 it, it became the International Alliance for Interoperability, and now, now the name is Building Smart. And we, we, I was one of the founding members of IAI when, when it became in, international, and uh, at that time, we, we thought that, that the development will be very fast and that industry will be moving to the BIM very rapidly. Well, now it has been for 20 years and then we are still on, on the way. But nevertheless, things have been happening. And, and so, when, as, as you know, probably that in, in, in the United States, GSA made BIM use mandatory in their project to look at the, the spatial program validation in 2006. 2007, Senate properties in Finland made it mandatory in all their projects, and, and UK government has been making it mandatory. Actually, it was April this year when it became mandatory, but they have been making preparations for six years. So things have been moving, but relatively slow. And that's typical to our industry. When we, we look at the, the other industries, and if you look at old pictures from the car manufacturing, uh, how it has been changing and then look at the, what has been happening in the same time frame in the construction industry, we still work very much the same way as we used to work even 100 years ago. So very little has been changing compared to the other industries. And as I said, that, that for some reason it needs, seems that the construction industry has a habit that we need the, the wake-up call. And very often this wake-up call is coming from the public clients. Almost in any country where the, the BIM adoption has been starting moving fast, it has been it was it has been happening because the public clients have made it mandatory to use BIM in their project, and it's now happening in, in many countries in Europe, following the, the UK example. And I go now quite back in the history that because in, in Finland we we started uh, our national BIM program very early in 1997. And uh, it didn't come from nowhere. It was really something that, that started from the, the situation that, that there was very active BIM research already in, uh, before that time in Finland. Matti Hanus, Kuh, Christian Björ, Kari Karstila were doing so-called Fratas project, which was very early uh, research on, on BIM. And uh, then in 1997, it became something that the industry wanted to, to really do something. And the timing was very good because it was happening at the same time when, when IAI started activities internationally. So we had very good platform to, to work with other companies. And then what uh, we, we found in a really big program in, in Finland, the Vera, Tietoverkotun uh, Rakennusprocessi in Finnish and Information Networking in the Construction Process, 
was a big program that I was leading in Finland in 1997-2002. And it was aiming to change the construction industry and also it was aiming to, to have some uh, implications in the, the impacts of the construction industry. So the goals, I'm not of course going through all the details, but the goals were that, that we would be able to have the integrated information management, uh, efficient use of information networks. And you have to remember that 1997 internet was still something very, relatively new. Many people were not using, for example, emails at that time. So it was quite a quite long time ago. And then the utilization of information and communication technologies in the AEC and FM processes, and then really re-engineering the, the processes so that, that they would be supporting the use of the information technology. And this was really a big effort, but when you think that Finland is a very small country, 5 million people, and the total budget of the program was 47 million euros 20 years ago, and more than 160 projects that we had in there. So, of course, it was a big investment nationally, and it was, of course, expected that, that you have to have results from that. And I think that, that we had quite good results, not, not perfect, but it was really changing the industry quite, quite rapidly, actually. And the basic goal was quite simple which is, of course, the, the, the basic goal of, of BIM as well, to get rid of the document-based information management. Because already at that time, most people were working using computers, but we were exchanging the information based basically on paper, or even if they were electronic documents, they were just human readable. Which meant that, that somebody has to reproduce that information again, if you want to use that in your processes, which is not adding any value in the process, but causing a lot of errors and friction in, in, instead. And, and that was something that, that we wanted to move to this idea to have the information so that it, it, it's in a data format which is computer readable, so that we can utilize the data directly in the different tasks in the processes, which is, of course, still today the relevant goal for BIM. But I, I would say that, that we are still in, in very many projects, we are in the situation that we are exchanging the, the information based on documents. I think that the vast majority of construction projects are still made in the, the old fashioned way. So it has been taking quite a long time to, to move into the uh, data sharing. And one, one picture that I want to share also from the, the program that in the first when we started the program, this was the information lifecycle image that we were using, starting from the briefing, going through the design process, the construction and facility management, and then of course when you uh, refurbish the building for new uh, purposes, kind of and you can utilize that information, and then finally you should be able to utilize that information also in the demolition. But then relatively soon we realized that, that there is something wrong with this picture. This is really a picture of, of life cycle information from the project viewpoint. Most of us have, have the background in the design or engineering or well, project management, and our world is, is consisting of projects. So we are really kind of um, thinking that. But it's not the same for the clients. Building owners and building end users have very different views. So we were updating that picture so that, that basically the reason for buildings is the use of the building. And that is usually mainly supported by the FM services. And the only situation where you really need the, the design and construction process is when your, change, your, your needs are changing. So basically, this is a very small part of building life cycle, and it's a problem solving, helping the clients to, to adapt to the new situation where they are. So from the client's viewpoint, design and construction is not at all their main business. It just, it's just, it's more, if, if I want to be provocative, it's more like a disturbance in their normal pro business processes because moving to the new facilities is usually causing quite a lot of disturbance in your business processes. So we should understand that that's our role in, in really the building life cycle. So it's not, design and construction is not the main purpose, it's just one way to, to solve some problems that our clients have. 
And what then happened in, in Finland was that the Senate properties decided that the, the Senate properties is the public building owner in Finland, that they wanted to start testing uh, BIM and they were organizing quite many uh, pilot projects. And in some pilot projects, they were just looking at one, one of the, the participants was using BIM or it was used only in the one phase of project or in the other end of the spectrum that all participants are using PIM, so we are speaking about the integrated use, and, and also that, that you are using that throughout the life cycle. The first one was the HUT 600, the new main auditorium for Helsinki University of Technology, which is nowadays Aalto University. And there, uh, as, as the result of, of these pilot projects, it made, uh, Senate Properties made a decision that, it, that in October 2007, they made use of being mandatory in all their projects. So that was quite unique situation in, in that sense that uh, even, even GSA at that point was using just BIM only in one part of the project, which was the space sub program validation, but Senate Properties was using that throughout the whole process. There is actually a very good report about this project still available on the Cypher website, the Stanford University website, Calvin Kamm, who was at that time a young PhD researcher, came to Finland and, and made the, the, collected the material for the uh, report. And I think that it's still in many ways valid when, when you look at that. Of course, the technology has been developing ever since, but many of the observations in, in that report are still very good today. And uh, it was also affecting so that, that because Calvin then when he came back to the United States, he went to, to GSA and was implementing the GSA team program. So it really had also some global uh, implications, uh, not, not only in Finland. And also what happened in Finland was that the Finnish construction industry adopted BIM very early. This is this picture is from 2002, so about 15 years ago, when uh, the Confederation of Finnish Construction Industry decided that BIM is core of the technology strategy. So this was basically before the, the uh, technology program that I was leading was ending. So industry was really adopting the results very, very rapidly. And the big construction companies started also to test and, and use BIM. And I would say that about from 2007, all big construction companies in Finland have been using BIM also in their own project, not only if Senat Robert is the client is mandatory. So what were the main, main results of the program? I would say that the wide adoption of BIM was definitely the, the main result. And of course, that was one of the, the main goals of the, the program. Also, what happened, not, not so much maybe you know, you know, was planned in, when we started the program, but because the timing was right, we had very good possibilities to build the international networks. And uh, I would say that that was really forming my career very much because without the program, I don't think that, that I would be here speaking and, and I, I wouldn't know so many people in, in, in this field as I know, but it, it gave me also very good possibilities to network with, with top universities around the world. Also, one of the, the outcomes was that, that uh, the program was actually developing quite, quite many uh, BIM software. The Tecla Structures is, is one of the, the outcomes, which is now part of Trimble. Solibri Model Checker, which is now owned by Nemetschek, it was also one of them. Uh, Magic CAD, which is the leading uh, MEP software in the Nordic market and now also very commonly used in, in the UK, is one of them. Pico software was also having its rules in, in Finland. So when, when you think about the size of the country, the amount of BIM software that, that has been coming from Finland is quite amazing. So I think that, that all in all, the program was quite successful. I think that Thomas can, in, in a way, confirm that because he was making the evaluation of the, the program, so he knows the, the results quite well. But then, what happened after that? Uh, when I think about the situation, that, that uh, the main, main thing that happened after that probably was this thin guidelines that, that we were creating in 2007 for Senate properties, and then they were updated in, in 2012 as the common BIM requirements in Finland. So they are now 
national requirements. They are also available in English if somebody wants to, to read them. So it's, it's quite comprehensive documentation about how to use BIM in, in different stages of the growth. So these the different volumes are telling about the different usages of BIM in, in different disciplines and different tasks. But then also some problems. It wasn't all rosy. So one of the, the things where I think that we failed was activation of the facility owners. Senate properties was active, but private building owners were not, and, and still today, are not very, very eager to, to demand BIM. So we haven't been able to, to really communicate the, the benefits of BIM as well as, as we should have. Then, what I think that almost always in the research program happens is that, that we are not very good in selling the results. So I think that we would have had much more potential than that we could achieve that, but, but it's, it's difficult to, to really... Researchers usually have the, the habit that, that you move to the next interesting topic when you finish that you are not doing the dissemination and most of the research institutes don't have very good mechanism to, to sell the ideas. The industry. And then also the big shortcoming was that, that we couldn't really start the, the BIM education in the early stages. Actually, many of the universities were totally against the idea of, of changing the education. Now the situation is much better, but it took very long time before the, the, really the university started to, to be actively involved in the, the BIM implementation. And very few universities made any, any research projects in, inside the program that I was leading. Actually, many, many uh, professors were totally against the idea. They were having the opinion that we know what we should be researching. It's totally wrong that TECES, our funding <coughs> agency, is saying that we should be really uh, researching BIM. And then also, one thing that I have been seeing, in a way, people have been getting tired about speaking about BIM. It has been taking so long time that people really feel that it's kind of, and it's, I don't want to speak about People are using BIM very widely, but the, the development in the last years has been relatively slow in Finland, much slower, for example, than in the UK. But now at, at the moment, I see some uh, light in the uh, end of the tunnel because just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a a decision that the government is, is starting a new program to, to make the built environment digital and, and the, the chief officer for that uh, demo is uh, very good in, uh, in, in uh, selling the ideas. He brought the uh, uh, hackathons in, in Finland. He started very actively that. He was also one person that was making the, the research of the BIM processes when I was still at BTT. And so he's, he's very good in, in selling the ideas. So I have the feeling that it might be repeating what happened in, in Vera when he's leading this new program. So I, at least I hope so, because in the last 10 years, the development in Finland has been relatively slow. So then moving to UK, what has happened there? I think that, that at the moment, really, when you, you think about the, the speed of the change, UK is probably number one. And it's quite interesting because when I moved to the UK in May 2010, the attitude was totally against the BIM. Most of the people in the universities and industry are giving some kind of a comment, that this kind of a comment that industry needs people who can make drawings, that uh, 3D modeling is too complex, too expensive, and uh, we can't start teaching that. And of course, it was a little bit frustrating situation when I started and so forth. That, that two people really think that this is not going to happen. But then it was there was really a big bang in, in the UK. Paul Morel in October 2010, so in the same year in the autumn, made, made a public statement that government will start demanding him. And Paul Morel was the chief construction advisor for the UK government. And that really changed the game almost overnight. It was a very rapid change of attitudes. And what was totally different compared to the situation with what I experienced in the early stages in Finland was that the industry was immediately behind this idea. I was in several of the, the committees in the, in the beginning, 
And I had never heard that any of the, the industry associations or professional associations would have been saying a word against this idea. Everybody wanted to be actively involved and everybody wanted to have a role in, in the development. So it really started very rapidly to change. And already in, in uh, next spring, uh, government was publishing this construction strategy, 2011, where they said that, that they will start demanding fully collaborative 3D BIM with all project and asset information and documentation being electronic as minimum by 2016. And I said that in April this year, this became true. And also, one of very unique situation is that cabinet ministers are speaking about PIM. This is the only place in the world where I have heard that, that politicians are speaking about PIM. Usually it's more like kind of the people who are doing some software development. And like in, in Finland, there were several steps that, that government started to, to have very many working groups looking at different aspects, starting pilot project, trying to measure the outcomes, Big difference was that that government wasn't putting that much money there. It was more like activating the, the resources in the industry. And uh, as the end result of that, that, a lot of things have been happening. And of course, one of the, the main goals there is this, this cumulative collection of information that avoiding the situation that every time when you are moving from one stage of the design to the next stage, and the, to, the, then the, to the construction, you are losing some data, which is very typical in, in the old processes that we have. So the information management throughout the life cycle was one of the, the main goals. Also the cost savings were one, one of the goals. You probably have been seeing this wedge that, that was published uh, by the uh, UK government work group already actually before that this became the uh, Hugh and Richard published this, I think, first, first time in 2008, where they, they were defining these different levels of being level zero, level one, level two, level three. And in the old documentation, one of the things that I didn't really like at all was the level three BIM, because it was very, very often understood that it would be one single model for the whole project. And it's a totally impossible idea. It will never happen. And this was something that I was very actively speaking in, in different situations that, that we should really kind of forget that idea. Because technically you can do it, but you can't do that, that when you think about the responsibilities and ownership of the data, meaning that who can change them. But it's, it's very deeply inbuilt in some people's minds that, that having several models is, is a mistake, but it's not. And, and now, in the, the latest developments, uh, they have been defining the level three very, very differently. As you can see, it's now integrated electronic information with full automated connectivity and web store. So it's really a very wide view of that. So it's, it's not anymore the, about the individual buildings, but as this illustration about level three BIM is that it's about the networked built environment so that buildings are connected to the information networks and, and infrastructures and, and the information is, is linked together. And this is something that I can also sign. I think that this is really what, what's going to happen in, in the future, that we are connecting different sources of information. Also, one of the things that has been happening in, in the UK is that that very clear notion that BIM is not about building zone. It's also about the, the infra, uh, infrastructures. And I think that one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced BIM project in the world is the Crossrail project. The railroad that is connecting the, the different railroads coming to London so that, that you can travel through the central London. It's an extremely complicated project when you think about that building, building a new railroad under London, central London where you have very, valuable buildings, extremely valuable buildings, and also a lot of other infrastructures like, like the two there. And so it's, it's, it's very challenging to, to manage that kind of a project. And it has been very successful. So they have been really uh, documenting quite significant uh, savings, as you can see here, that, that the cost of the modeling was something like 120,000 pounds, and the savings were over 8 million. 
Of course, these are something that depends how you calculate, but, but nevertheless, the client is, in, in this case, is, is very clearly stating that this is saving significantly money. And also one of the things that I, I really like in that project is the idea that they, they really see the use of information, not only in the facility management, but also providing the services for the end users of the railroad. So they see that this really is about the, the life cycle information management and efficient use of the, the information in, in activities that you provide for, for your customers. So I think that, that there are lots of, lots of really good ideas that, that, that are implemented in practice already now in, in the UK, even though it's, it's relatively new there. Then also about the pilot project that they have been doing, they have already been uh, documenting that, that the cost target that uh, they set, 20% uh, uh, savings in the construction costs by using BIM has been achieved in some projects. To be honest, I, I don't know how they calculate this because it's very difficult to, to calculate the project savings because every project is different. But nevertheless, this is something that they are publishing at least in the figures, which means that, that they, the government working groups are quite happy with the, the result. And of course, clear indication that, that the results have been quite positive is that two of the, the government organizations, Highway Agency and Ministry of Justice, reached 100% use of BIM already before it became mandatory. So they started to use that in all their projects. And that's usually the, the strongest evidence that, that things are going well if people start using that without that somebody is forcing them to use it. Also, the, the use of BIM has been quite steadily increasing in in UK. This is based on the national uh, BIM reports where they are asking from companies that how many companies are using BIM. It's not necessarily at, at all the, the same as, as how many projects are using BIM, but, but uh, because some big companies might have a couple of BIM projects, and of course they report that they are using BIM. The small drop that we have there in 2014 is my own interpretation is that it wasn't really dropping, it was more that people started to be more aware of what, me, what it means to use BIM. So it was more realistic view about that, that do we, do we really use BIM. But nevertheless, one, one interesting thing that, that you can see from the reports is that everything is not quite as rosy as, as people like to, to present. And, and I made a comparison of the, the report kind of looking first at that uh, they have always the question that are you using BIM next year? And these are the, the answers, and, and as you can see, it's very high percentage. Then when you take the next year's report and question that how many are using BIM now, which should be, of course, the same if they would be realistic in, in estimation. The reality is, is quite, quite different. The, the reality is, is something like 25-30% behind the, the expectation. And I think that this is very difficult. People are too optimistic about how quickly they can change the ways that they are working. Mm -hmm. it's, it's increasing, but it's not increasing as fast as people, people believe that it could be possible. I think that this is something that we see everywhere in the world, that, that in, the, in the short term we are overestimating our ability to change. And that's the reason why I, I'm presenting these pictures, that I, I really want to be realistic about the, the kind of and how quickly we can change the, the way that the industry is working. It takes time, we have to be patient. But then, again, one very, very interesting image is this. This is from, uh, kind of the text is not quite correctly there, but this is from David Philip. This was, he, he presented this in one conference a uh, couple of weeks ago in Edinburgh, where I was also speaking, he was looking at the 10 most in-demand jobs in the construction industry. And as you can see, all of those 10 jobs are something that didn't exist some 10 years ago, 15 years ago. All are related to information management and BIM. So this is something that it's, it's really very good to use as a motivation for the, the students 
if you really want to have a job in the construction industry, these are the places where you can put, put your efforts. If you are good in, in, in BIM or in information management, you will probably find a job relatively easy. Without that, not so likely. And also the salaries in this area is much, much higher than in average in the beginning of your career. So definitely the industry is changing and the demand for the, the BIM competent people is, is increasing quite rapidly. Also, one of the things that I want to, to emphasize is that, that change doesn't stop here now when we have the level three, level two BIM, uh, which is demanded. Now we have the new construction strategy, construction 2025, which is having even more ambitious goals and it's uh, aiming to the level three BIM. And there's also one quite in interesting report or, or vision paper about what built environment 2050 of course, to be honest, I don't think that anyone knows in, in the long term. I don't think that anyone can really predict what, what's going to happen in 35 years in, in our industry. But nevertheless, it's, it's important that people have some expectations, some visions where they want to go. And this report was done with uh, relatively young researchers. I think that, that uh, David Philip was probably the oldest person in, in the, the committee that was making the paper. So most of them were something kind of um, under 30 years old. So it's, which is, to me, it's, it's the right way to do things because as I have been saying that from my viewpoint, built environment 2050 is not very interesting because mo most probably I'm not living anymore. <laughs> and definitely not working because I would be 100 years old at that point. So, so it's, it's really something that we have to, to really get the, the young people engaged in the strategic development. And, and that was something that I really liked in the UK. And again, a slide from David Philip. He, he said that BIM has woken the industry up. And my interpretation in, from that is that it wasn't BIM, it was the UK government. After that, when they made the, the, the demand, many of the industrial companies started to do more than the government is required because they started to see the benefits, but they wouldn't have started that without the force. So somebody has to first kind of make the wake up call, then the industry starts doing things. And when they realize that this is beneficial, they, they go further. Also one of the, the impact of, of uh, the uh, UK has been that they, they have been very active in driving the, the public sector procurement in the construction sector on the EU level. So there is a big working group been for EU, which is looking at the possibilities to make EU-wide uh, regulations. Of course, now it's interesting to see what will happen with the Brexit, but that's another story and I'm, I'm not going there. But, but nevertheless, UK has had a big impact, especially in France and, and, and Germany, but also in other European countries about the BIM adoption. So they really started something. And I've been sometimes saying that as long as it was something that was happening in the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, nobody cared because those countries are so small that they are not in competition with any, any of the big economies. But when UK does something, that, that immediately has some impact in France and in Germany because they definitely want to be com com competing with the UK. But then the, the last part of my presentation is really one thing that, that I want to emphasize, that it's, this is not about the technology. And I think that this Kunas Aksanova's picture kind of on that we have been trying to, to sell the BIM by pushing the technology uphill is it's, it's really kind of on this Sisyphus uh, it was uh, syndrome that it, it really doesn't hold very well. We have to think about the other things, especially the, the business processes. So one of the things that, that this is an analysis from the interviews that the Tunas made in Finland, and it's interesting when you look at the, the words that are there, you probably might know this, it, uh, this analysis of uh, that the size of the text is, is indicating how often it's mentioned in the, uh, the discussions. Something is totally missing. You can't find the word collaboration anywhere. There is nothing about the business models. There is nothing about the procurement models. And these are, of course, the, the fund, fundamental things 
for the industry change. Unless it's supporting your businesses, you can't make that change. And we, we all know that, that it, it, it's very often the situation that everybody in, in construction projects is trying to minimize their own workload rather than collaborating. Because the, the procurement systems are, are not supporting the collaborative working. So to me, it is really something that, that the, the clients, owners should be really thinking that how are we procuring services and, and selecting and incentivizing our teams. Is the team really capable to do what you ask them to do? Or is it still the situation that they are just trying to minimize their own workload? <laughs> Unless we change the, the business models in our industry, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about that, how deep collaboration we can have. So the best examples that I know that, that which have been changing the business models are the, the, really the IPD project, for example, for Southern Health, where they really have been changing the way that they are paying the, the, the team. So coming from Liverpool, I've been using this as a metaphor and kind of wonder, when, if you think of that, that you should be build a soccer team, would you be selecting the cheapest player in every position? And, and if you do that, do you really think that it would be a very successful team? Nobody does. But why do you think that it, it works in the construction? No, sorry, you're But that is, that is to me, it is really something that why are we thinking that people are collaborating if they don't benefit from that? There has to be some benefit. So that today, what in the one of the presenters was this: What's there for me? And I think it's a very relevant question. So we should, in my opinion, we should really select the players who have the right skills, not necessarily the, the most expensive players, because in, in, if I continue this soccer uh, analogy, it wouldn't be a very good team if you would have the most expensive players in every position, because there would be huge internal competition who is the star. But you have to have a team which can play together. Everybody can play the position where they are. And the same way, the, the successful construction project should be selected by the, the ability to work together as a team. And, but that's, of course, much more difficult than, than asking the, the price and selecting the cheapest players. But still, I think that, that it's something that, that our industry should be really considering that, that how to do that change. So I want to end with a very famous quotation. I think that the situation now in construction industry is very much like this kind of a, like evolution. Mm -hmm. the, the companies that will be surviving are the companies who know how to adapt to this changing situation. And of course, the target is moving. It's not something that, that when you learn to use BIM, you can stop and relax because things are, are developing. So you have to keep on developing also your own activities. But this is something that it's very new. When I, when I graduated as an architect really long time ago, at that time, the attitude in our industry was that when you graduate, you are ready. You don't have to study anymore. You know everything that, that it's worthwhile knowing from construction. But it's not, not like that anymore. Situation is changing so rapidly that we have to, to be able to, to adapt to the new situations if we want to survive in, in our industry. So, thank you.